How bad is tap water? I mean, I'll say that I grew up drinking tap water. I grew up in New York City. As did I. Yeah. Grew up drinking it. Garden hoses. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, yeah, same. I think you're, you'd be well-suited filtering your water. Because um, also, I mean, so one of these compounds that um, has been directly linked to Parkinsonism that uh, has Ray, Dr. Ray Dorsey from University of Rochester has published on, um, it's called trichloroethylene. And it's still being used in dry cleaning today, but it has been it was used since until the 70s in for certain medical applications. It was used as, as an anesthetic for pregnant women. It was used to decaffeinate coffee. It was used to extract uh, oil, ve vegetable oils readily infiltrates groundwater. And about 30%, I believe, of groundwater in the United States is, is still contaminated with this compound, trichloroethylene. And um, we know that there are traces of pharmaceuticals and various, you know, compounds in tap water that I think, you know, the dose makes the poison to some degree. Um, so now and then I think it's probably fine, but I do think, you know, filtering your water, running it through a charcoal filter, um, maybe even a reverse osmosis purifier is probably beneficial. Does that get the fluoride out? A reverse osmosis purif purifier does, yeah. But not a charcoal filter. No. There are some. There's one brand, I don't remember the name, but there is. there are some pitcher filters that do claim to uh, remove fluoride, but... Um, does the reverse osmosis remove the minerals from the water as well, though? Yeah, it removes everything. So well, you, that's not good. Yeah. So you need minerals. You do need mineral, minerals. Like what is hard... When you get hard water from a well... You get that white stuff. Too much. Is it, what is that? Too many. Yeah, too many minerals. Is that bad for you? You know, I don't know. Um, probably. I mean, pr it's probably you know, in in some way, if that's all you're drinking, and um, and who knows what else that water has been able to leach through the pipes or what have you. Speaking of which, have you seen uh, the recent study that came out? It was very recent on um, these dishwashing pods. Damn. Yeah. No. But. Dish dishwasher pods are putting forever chemicals all over your glasses and your Ugh. plates. And see, can you find that? See if you can find that. Um, I think it just came out very recently. Oh, this one was not recent. This is not recent. Gut epithelial barrier damage caused by dishwasher detergents and rinse aids. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, I think it's one of them. Yeah. Which when when was this study published? December twenty two. Twenty two. Um, there was something that uh, I read. Uh, I believe I read yesterday, but that they're they're starting to seriously consider. Health news, Bloomberg. Okay. So you know what one of the major problems with with endocrine disruptors are, Did Joe? Church? What is that? In the field of toxicology, there's this maxim that the dose makes the poison. Right. Right. Like. That we establish the what's called the no observed adverse effect level for a given compound, and then we assume that below that, exposure is safe, right? And so that's why you always say, the, or why you always hear that exposure to these compounds is fine because the dose makes the poison, and they're very small, you know, in terms of the doses that we're being exposed to. But the problem with endocrine disruptors, and this is not fully appreciated, I think, by the vast majority of people, is that unlike most compounds which follow a, a linear dose response where, you know, you consume too much water at a certain point fast enough and it'll kill you, but below that you're fine. A lot of these endocrine disruptor co disrupting compounds have what's called a non-monotonic dose response. So a non-monotonic dose response means that at a low level, you might have effects and you might not have effects at a, for a, a, a period above that dose. And then you might have toxic effects at a much higher dose. Mm. You might have completely different effects at a low dose. So low dose toxicity, that's the issue. And hormesis is a perfect example of this working in our favor. And it's a, it's a perfect example of a non-monotonic dose response that we actually want. Like broccoli sprouts. Like broccoli sprouts, yeah. So at a very low dose, broccoli sprouts, this compound sulforaphane in, produced by broccoli sprouts creates a, uh, a beneficial effect in the body, a response where you know, it causes our livers to increase production of glutathione, and we seem to have this protective adaptive response to it, right? But if you were to consume too much sulforaphane, it would kill you, right? And so one of the issues with these compounds like phthalates and other endocrine disruptors, but phthalates in particular, is that they have what's called a non-monotonic dose response, which makes them really difficult to study, and it makes guidelines surrounding them really tricky. 
And so the idea is that we might be, you might experience effects due to a low dose exposure that aren't necessarily killing you, right? But that are still deter- deemed safe, you know? So it's not quite a linear dose response. It can be, you know, a U-shaped curve, for example. Um, and so that's a, that's a big issue. That makes, it, ma- it makes these chemicals hard to study. Um, and that's one of the major concerns within the field of toxicology surrounding these kinds of, these kinds of compounds. 